God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is good. All, All the time. time. Good morning, church. Good morning. There's a lot of people we haven't seen for a while here this morning. <clears throat> it's been a long time since I've seen this many kids in here. And that's, that's always great to see. There's got all kinds of youngsters running around, so that's always good. But it's good to have you out with us. Let me see if this works. All right. We'll get there in a minute. I never know. Just a couple of announcements. I want to make sure that you remember that next week we turn the clocks ahead an hour. All right? And I think we should keep it that way. Whether the government likes it or not, yeah. we'll be early for some and late for others. But uh, anyway, so don't forget that. So let's bring ahead one hour. Also, uh, starting this week, there is a mass exodus towards uh, Tennessee, and uh, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be traveling for Caitlin and Austin's wedding, and Larry and Barb will be gone for a couple of weeks, basically. Uh, so they, they, this will be their last Sunday with us for about uh, two more weeks after today. And then uh, they'll be leaving on the 12th, and then uh, Cinda is planning to leave on Thursday, and Kay and Pam and Rick and Cindy plan to travel on Friday. And so those of you who are visiting with us, please come back. <laughs> it's going to be, yeah. But uh, we, you know, we're excited uh, for that, uh, for the wedding and everything. So uh, I think Jen and Steve are leaving Thursday. Thursday. So, um, yeah. 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 Yeah, so. They'll, they'll be going with the rest of them. So anyway, that's all, all that is. A lot of that is in your bulletin. Please look at it over. Um, we are starting our Wednesday night Bible class here in the auditorium on the seventeenth. So uh, please remember that. Those of you who are traveling, we'll talk about you. Because you're, you're not here. But um, anyway, we'll do that. Uh, another very important lesson thing we have here is the. Uh, the uh, Potter Pantry shopping list that's in the bulletin. They will be picking those things up April the 18th. Uh, we have, Cinda has put some boxes in the back of the auditorium uh, to my left over here, and uh, thank her for that, and you can put things in there. So please, let's fill those boxes up and get them all uh, to that, uh, that minister. Can't think of anything else that's pressing. There are people listed in our bulletin that, that are in need of uh, our prayers and uh, the, their, the reasons that are, are in the bulletin, I'm not going to go over them at this time. So let's get into our worship this morning. If you are visiting with us, I'm sorry, please fill out one of the visitor's cards. Uh, this way, if there's you know, something going on with the congregation uh, that you might want to be aware of, uh, please fill one of those out so we can get a hold of you and uh, a way to get on our uh, list of, of our phone contacts. So uh, with that in mind, two, for the next two weeks, there won't be any bulletin online. David is taking care of uh, the, the paper bulletin. And anything you need to be in the bulletin, please see him. So I'm going to get that out too. And uh, he'll gladly do all of that. <laughs> I think that's about it. So let's worship. <clears throat> Do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also be, may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. <clears throat> Find us together, Lord, find us together with hope that cannot be broken. Find us together, Lord, find us together, find us together with love. There is only one God, you say, there is only one King, there is only one body, there we go. That is why we can sing. Find us together, Lord, find us together with four that cannot be broken. Find us together, Lord, find us together, Lord, find us together with love. Our common love for each other, common Oh. 
right now. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And the song will be led in our opening prayer. <clears throat> So Anytime that she needs guidance, please help her see that you are the one the rest of her life that she can turn to to help her throughout the walk the rest of her life. Please be with uh, David as he's about to present another lesson from your word. Thank you so much for blessing him with the ability to come up here and speak every week. Let us keep uh, his lesson in hearts and minds and take it out to the world better serve you. Jesus name we pray. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Lord, 
I can remember as a small child, we had an older brother who had singing. And he was what we would call sang low and slow. <laughs> and invariably he would pick, I gave my life to him. I appreciated that temple. And how often we sing songs from memory is me and, and uh, know the words, we really focus in 
I'll do his work. I gave my life for thee, my precious beloved, I shed, that thou mightst ransom thee and quicken the of the dead. I might ransom thee. That's the best all. And I was saying over ransom. But it never occurred to me what ransom really means. Quicken from the dead. I just thought quicken from the dead meant you got rid of dead quick. <laughs> and that's what's going to be quick. But after some serious consideration, understand what ransom did. There's a payment that is demanded in order to attain release from some. In other words, if someone is kidnapped, if we were kidnapped and says, you can have them back for X number of years. You have to pay the ransom. That's what Jesus said. I gave my life for you. Precious blood I shed. That thou might ransom be quickened from the dead. Made alive. That's what it means. Made alive. We're not dead eternally. But through Jesus and the sacrifice that he made, we're alive. Correct. And then Jesus says in, in the song, I let my home in heaven, my glory circle throne, to down the earth of wanderings sad and more. He said, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left aught for me? Context of the song, I always thought, I left all for thee. Have, have you left uh, all for me? And I thought, that's not, what, not me at all. So I left it all for thee. What did you give it up? I gave it all. But what could be given up for me? <clears throat> At the end of that song, it asks four really important questions that we need to think about. Number one, what did you give to me? Yeah. Jesus asked. Number two, have you given everything for me? Or have you gone back? Number three, have you suffered or sacrificed in your life for me? And the fourth question, what gifts have you brought me? That takes on a whole new significance. And that's all for me. When we look at the words and see what Jesus really did for us, Father, we're so, so grateful the words can not express our thanks for your love for Jesus and his holiness to come to the earth knowing and knowing what he's going to face and still willing to go through that terrible, terrible persecution and sacrifice. We're thankful, Father, <clears throat> before he came back to you, he, he left his 
Father, as we continue this bread, we ask that we be able to focus us on his life, his body, what he has done for us, and continues to do. We pray you bless each of us. Father, particularly the cup, when we realize not only the suffering that Jesus has been through for us, we realize, Father, that <clears throat> this is the beginning of the new covenant. That his blood is initiated by the new covenant that we live under today. So, she's very grateful for that. This happened to be with her. Help her to be faithful to the truth. To the aspect of Jesus. You may have noticed there's a basket here. The table, there's one in the back of that table. And this we so desire to see the opportunity we had to go to the Lord, to the church, so that His work could be carried out. Not only in this area, in this community, but throughout the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us in this life. Maybe not in this world, there's much as some that we need. And help us, Father, to see the needs. And help us to fulfill our responsibility to help those who are in need. That you proclaim your word in this community. Again, we ask that you bless those in Jesus' name. Amen. I love new songs, but sometimes the old songs have a lot better words. Most of my girls like some of the old songs, so that's, you know, we'll mix it up real good. Appreciate the words that I have today. Heart to heart talk with Jesus. So let's stand as we sing this song. Remain standing for the scripture reading that will follow. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then the light from heaven filled my soul. It wrote my name above, and wrote my name above, and 
where scribes who made copies of the manuscripts would add their, their commentary to the margins over what a particular verse meant. And then over time, those commentaries tend to make their way into text. That happens. There are manuscripts, it's documented where this happens, but we know about it. There are many textual variants that are just simple misspellings of words, or these simple misspellings can sometimes just change the word outright. I mean two different things. But again, we know where they are, and so we can deal with them. And so today's text could very, could very well be one of those things. A story, perhaps, that was well known in the early church that made its way around and somebody, some scribe said, this is a good place to fit this in. We don't want this to get lost. That doesn't mean that it's not inspired, but there is a possibility that it is not authentically from our Apostle John. So we need to go forward with that in mind. My personal conviction, convictions are that it is inspired. I, that is my personal conviction, if it's worth anything. But people will point to things like this, like our passage today, who are opposed to the Bible, and they'll see these textual variants and they'll use them as a way to just dismiss the Bible as a whole. They say, well, if you can't trust that part, how do I know I can trust any other part of the Bible as being reliable? And so we need to be able to identify these textual variants, where these problem areas lie, and then be able to work through them. So I'm not going to go much further into it than that, but I want to conclude the, the textual variant talk with these few things. We have to remember that they are identified and documented, and we know where the trouble areas are. That should give us great comfort, knowing where the problem areas are. What these textual variants say does not hurt doctrine, and it does not hurt the message of the gospel. So at the heart of the gospel, it is untouched by anything any textual variant says. And if there were any textual variant that said something uh, disputed, we have undisputed verses to uh, substantiate what we believe. So the worst case scenario, just to, to wrap this up, is if there's any troubled passage, we know where it is, it's documented, and we can handle it. So with all that being said, we're out of perhaps the boring part of the lesson, and we can move on. Move on to the good stuff. So, I hope you have your Bibles. Open them up to John chapter 8. And I hope you have your sandals. I hope you have your your uh, cloak, maybe your, your head covering, whatever you need, because we're about to take a trip back to first century Jerusalem. You're ready for the trip, because here we go. You were one of the people back in the first century Jerusalem, at the Feast of Booths. This Feast of Booths that we just spent the last five weeks talking about. And you were one of the people who heard Jesus speak. And you were just floored by what he had to say. And you were convinced that he was, in fact, the Christ. He was the Messiah that you had been waiting for. And you, so you heard that he was back at the temple today. He's back in the temple teaching. What a great opportunity to go and hear the Messiah speak. So you decide, I'm going to get all my family. I'm going to get all my friends. We're going to go down to the temple. We're going to hear the Messiah speak. Perhaps we can even ask him a few questions. There's, there's things I've been dying to know. What a great opportunity. So you make, make your way up to the temple. You, you're in this crowd of people who are all so excited to hear the Messiah speak. And then all of a sudden, you hear off in the distance a woman shrieking and wailing. You look out, your attention turns from Jesus, and you see this group of scribes and Pharisees making their way towards you and towards Jesus. You see them approach with a smug look on their face, with this woman in tow who's been shrieking and wailing. They drag her by the hair and throw her before you and before Jesus. And so the scene is now set with this woman who was just heartbroken before Jesus and on the other side a group of accusers with the law on their side. You know that nothing good is going to come from this. You know this is a bad situation. And so this is essentially the scene that we 
approach with our text today. This is, well, called the setup, verses 1 through 5. Let's go ahead and read those verses together. They each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Your translation might say the very act. Has been caught in adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? What do you say, Jesus? Now there's a few things I'd like to highlight here. The verbiage that's used, she was caught in adultery, implies that they seized her while the adultery was taking place. That you can't get more definitive that it took place than that. They seized her during the act. That, that raises some questions. Well, what about the guy? The text doesn't say anything about that. Like I said, some translations will say during the very act. Now, if you catch somebody in the very act, like I said, it removes the possibility of this being a false claim. So it dismisses the idea that Jesus could have said, well, where is your evidence? How do you know that this was really going on? It eliminates that possibility. And verse 5 and 6 really tell us what they're up to. You know that they were scheming. Verse 5 and 6, we'll look at those one more time. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say, Jesus? They said, this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. That was their plan all along. They wanted to try and trap Jesus into making the wrong move so they could bring a charge against him. They're trying to pin Jesus up against the law. When you're pinned up against the law, that's a hard place to be in, and that's the position that our woman was in when you think about it. They say, well, Moses said this. What are you going to say? Are you going to agree with Moses, or are you going to disagree with Moses? You don't want to be in that position if you're a faithful Jew. And so right away, we see, I guess, the setup. We see the solution that Jesus brings into the situation. Verses 6 through 9. Again, this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And at once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. There's a lot of great stuff in these few verses, but let's start in verse 6. Speaking against Moses and not carrying out the law of Moses would have given them enough to bring a charge against him. His goose would have been cooked. It would have been a bad situation for him to not uphold the law. But look at the way Jesus responds. There's a few things we can learn from this. The first is this. He didn't answer right away. He didn't answer right away. That's so unlike us in a lot of ways. When somebody's badgering us to give an answer, sometimes it's easier for us to just snap back and say whatever's on our mind, and sometimes it's not the best thing to say. Jesus takes his time in giving his answer. This is a great practice for us Christians. When we make our way out there into the community and we butt up against people who don't believe what we believe, and sometimes they'll, they'll badger us for answers that we might not have, give yourself some time to think. Give the right answer, the best answer you can. Keep composed like Jesus was and don't just react. Don't have that knee-jerk reaction, emotional reaction to whatever's coming your way. So we continue. These people, these scribes and Pharisees, the text says they continued to ask. Now, in other words, they badgered him. What do you say? What are you going to say? What's your answer? What's your answer, Jesus? What do you have to say about this? Are you going to uphold the law? 
this is the scene that we're seeing here. They're, they're, they would get on my nerves. I don't know about you. They continue to badger Jesus for his response. And Jesus' answer, despite their, their badgering, is just masterful. It's masterful. I, I would never be able to think of this response in a million years. Look at verse 7. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus grants them permission to uphold the law. Do it. Do it. Uphold the law. It's the right thing to do. It is the right thing for you to do if she actually committed adultery for you to start throwing rocks at her. The law commands it. Get going. But, but, well, not only that, in saying do it, he's showing that he's in agreement with the law. So he's, he's good there. But he also puts a requirement on them to apply the law first to themselves. He who is without sin. You have to look at yourself through the lens of the law and see, are you without sin? And the obvious conclusion that every one of them had to reach was, no, I'm not. I'm not without sin. I'm sinful just like this woman. And in fact, perhaps I deserve to have the rock thrown at me. You know, it's far more difficult to throw condemnation and guilt at somebody when you stop for a moment and look at yourself and you see that I'm guilty too. It's so much harder to do that. Perhaps you're... I'll tell you the story real quickly. When I was younger in my Christian walk, I was riding along with my parents in the car and there was this lady driving in front of us if, if you're a road rager, you know what I'm talking about. There's this lady driving in front of us who was just going too slow. And I wasn't the one driving, but I took offense to that. Doesn't this woman know that I have some place to be? She was inconveniencing me. But I didn't know what she was going through. Maybe she was having a really bad day. And so I'm throwing all these, my problems on her. Even though I'm the one who has all. I'm the one who's inconvenienced, and it's not a big deal. Anyway, I got off track there, but we're, we're getting back to it. So, it's so much more difficult to throw the condemnation on somebody when you see yourself as also condemned, guilty. Let he who is sinless start throwing. When Jesus says this, this is kind of subtle, but the way that Jesus says it is is in the force of a command. This is an imperative. Sinless one, start throwing. Pick up the rocks and go. You have a legal, legal obligation to kill this woman. It's the right thing to do. But none of them could do it. Why? Because they were sinful. Now let's ask us, ourselves this question. Who alone in that group of people had the right to start throwing the rocks. Jesus. But what did he do? He didn't throw the rocks. He alone stands to give right judgment of any, any man, any woman. He alone has that right. How much time do you think passed before the men threw down their stones and went away? Can't really say how much time had passed. There have been a couple minutes. Sometimes it takes some time for us to mull over what's been said. We don't want to let go of that pride too quickly. Let's read verses 8 and 9 together. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. I imagine... That what Jesus has just said, he was without sin, cast the first stone, would have been rather piercing and convicting. We know it was because they left. That's the evidence of that. Notice too that Jesus returns to just right in the dirt. This tells us something else. 
sometimes it takes a little time for the words to marinate in somebody's mind and take hold. We have to let the truth marinate sometimes. Like we said last week, we live in a culture that expects instant results. We want people to act now. Act now, call the next 20 minutes, right? Do it right now. Sometimes the truth needs to marinate in the minds of those who hear it. And we don't want to be like the scribes and Pharisees and badger them with the truth because sometimes that is not effective. But above all this, we need to make sure that we speak that truth in love and not just for the sake of hurting somebody. I'll say this too to go with that. Those who have ears to hear will hear in due time. We need to make sure we're speaking that truth in love Give them time to marinate in that truth and those who are going to hear it will hear. Something else. Notice that it's the older men who go away first. The older men go away first, not the younger. Why is that? Perhaps it's the case that a lot of times the older men are typically wiser. They have more life experience. They've probably spent more time in sin just having lived longer. So they're able to recognize what Jesus has just taught a little faster. And so they're the first ones to go away. Those who are older. Now we'll change. With youth tends to come a lot of pride. Youth and pride tend to go hand in hand. And here's what I mean by that. Young people tend to feel invincible. When you're young, you feel like you can jump off of buildings and, and do all kinds of crazy stuff because you're young. You don't know any different. You feel invincible. You feel like you're always right. I'm always right. Nobody else has had this thought before, just me. When you're young, sometimes, you know, you just, you know better than your parents did. I know better than mom and dad. They don't know what it's like, right? We've all been there. But the older ones are the ones who set the precedent for what the younger ones are going to do. In other words, they lead by example. It's important we say this, that we lead by example. Our little eyes, and we have a lot more of them in here this morning than usual. Our little eyes are watching. They're seeing the example that we set and make no mistake, little eyes doesn't apply just to little children either. It can apply to those who are young in the faith. Those who are Christians that are just less mature. So really, the older can be younger. Younger can be older. But little eyes are watching. Do they see those of mature faith leading like these people? Do they see those of mature, mature faith leading to good places, places of spiritual nourishment, greater spirituality, places of more and greater prayer, greater fellowship together with the saints. Do they see people of mature faith leading to bad places, places that appease our sensuality, our senses, good feelings, the lusts of this world over spiritually healthy things? Do they see us going to bad places or do they see the mature going no place at all? Adrift, aimless, and without any goals whatsoever. Just existing. Now this doesn't apply just to the church. It doesn't apply just to church leadership, elders, deacons, preachers like myself. This applies to families, grandparents, Parents, your little eyes are watching. Where do they see you going? Now, if we're not setting a good example, if we're not leading the little eyes to where they should go, there's a few things that we need to do. The first thing we should do is follow the example of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, how often do you get to say that? That's very rare. Following their example. We see here, however small it may be, but we see here humility. The recognition that, okay, I'm in the wrong. I'm not doing something right. 
you got to start there. If you're not willing to start with humility, that's it. You have to be willing to say, I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm not handling things rightly. <clears throat> so, set be a good example with humility. But we need to take it one step further. Because since we recognize that we haven't been doing something right, we need to follow that up with repentance. Repentance. Where we say, God, I have been going my own way. I have not taken your will into consideration. I have not invited you into the decisions of my life. I'm sorry, and I want you to be an intimate part of my life. I have not put you at the center of my life. And I've, I've sought counsel and guidance from other things and not you. We need to be able to repent with humility and start on that right path. Now we believe, we believe in and serve a merciful and a gracious Lord who says that he will forgive us when we confess those sins, when we walk in the light as he is in the light. And that's what we're going to see really in the rest of our passage. So we've dealt with the setup, the Pharisees and the scribes coming in. We've, we've dealt with the solution what Jesus says to dispel the accusers. And now we're going to deal with the Savior. Let's talk about the Savior now in verses 10 through 11. Let's read those together. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What a blessed situation. And the first thing that we see in these few verses is that Jesus dispels the accusers. Jesus dispels the accusers. Now, sometimes the accusers are right in their accusations. Sometimes the, the accusations they bring against you are true. I remember there were times when I was still working, again, early on in my Christian faith, where I would do or say something, and somebody would say, well, that's not very Christ-like. You ever heard that one? Boy, talk about getting under your skin. That's not very Christ-like. Well, no, it's not. It wasn't. You're right. Sometimes those accusers are accurate in their assessment of you. But what does Jesus do? He says, has no one condemned you? No. Nobody condemns you. Well, why not? That's because accusations and condemnation cannot stand in the face of God's grace. They can't. If God's grace is really there, really present within your life, any accusation that's brought against you, if you're living within grace, has no place to stand. Take the shackles off. How good does that feel? It might be true. You know what? It's true. I haven't been a perfect Christian. But I rely fully on the grace of God and not my performance. That doesn't mean I don't try. That doesn't mean I don't give it my best effort. That doesn't mean that I'm sinless. But it means your, ac your accusations hold no weight. God's grace blocks that out. That's the promise, and that's what's available for you, Christian. And for those who are not Christians, that's available to you. Jesus goes on to say, Neither do I condemn you. The one who had the right to, who could see that she was guilty. He says, go and sin no more. How could he say that? How could he say that? Now, there's two things I want to discuss here. The first is this, is that when God's grace is properly understood and received, your enslavement to wanting to sin is no more. It ceases. That doesn't mean you don't sin. That doesn't mean that you don't have streaks of sin, but it means you are not enslaved to it. And to go with that, your worldly affections begin to diminish over time as your love for God grows. Remember this, we can't forget this fact. That we love, we love God. Why? Because He first loved us. He initiated it all. He first loved us. And so God's love for us, expressed in His grace, 
is what grows our love for him. It's what grows our love for him. If we never experienced the grace of God in our own lives, what would give us any inclination that we would grow in our affection for God? If we're not growing in our affection for God, there's a good chance that we really don't understand his love for us and the grace that he has extended to us through Jesus. The worldly affections diminish as our love for God grows. The next thing we need to realize as we begin to round out this lesson, we need to realize that we are all this woman. We are all this woman caught in adultery. Here's what I mean. We have all lived lives of unfaithfulness and high-handed rebellion against our sovereign, holy creator. We have been unfaithful to him, and we have given ourselves over willingly to the lust of our flesh and to the lusts of this world, and we stand justly condemned before him. That's our objective situation outside of Christ. For those who are Christians, we we'll also like this woman a little more. We've come before him guilty. We've come before him with nothing good in of ourselves to give him. We have no excuse to offer him. We're guilty. But we have also, like this woman, been the recipients of his grace. We've been released from the just condemnation, the law that stands against us. We've been released from the accusations of our accusers, namely Satan. And we've been released from the consequence of eternal hell. That's the blessing of being a Christian. Those who are not yet Christians are still like this woman before Jesus has ever spoken to her. They're still like this woman in that they stand objectively guilty and fully deserving of any consequence of their sin. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin, that which you earn because of your sin, is what, church? Death. If you haven't taken the time to read this verse up here at the top of the book, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It doesn't have to be that way. That is the gift of God. That is the grace of God, and it's available to you today. Take hold of it. So why was Jesus able to forgive this woman's sin and to just let her go? Did he disregard the law? No, he said that the law is good. The law should be upheld. It's the right thing to do. That punishment should take, care, took, take place because of law breaking. He didn't sweep her sin under the rug. He didn't let it slide like it was just no big deal. Sin is very serious. Serious enough that it cost Jesus his life. Sin must be punished. It will be punished. And justice must be met out. But Jesus forgave her. And that he released her from that condemnation. Neither do I condemn her. Because of the future punishment and justice that he would receive on her behalf on the cross. That cross was a certainty before the world even began. Before the foundations of the world, Jesus was slain as a lamb. For sinners like her and me and everyone in here. He didn't sweep her, sin, sweep her sin under the rug. The justice demanded by the law was upheld. And because that cross was a certainty from eternity past, God's grace and mercy has always been available for those who believe. You believe in church? That grace and mercy is for you today. Do you believe non-Christian, somebody who hasn't become a Christian yet? That's available for you too. For those who are not Christians, I urge you today, lay hold of that grace. Don't stand condemned before your Creator on your judgment day. If you want to become a Christian, become a Christian by submitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Having your sins washed away in the waters of baptism where Jesus says He's going to raise you up to be a new creation. Have a new life in Him. And become part of this church. Even if you're a member of the church already, but you've been unfaithful, you, you kind of feel like that adulteress a little bit. You know you've been unfaithful and you need some help. Let us help you today.
We love you. If there's anything at all we can do to serve you, we stand ready to serve. Please come forward as we stand and sing. song. We haven't sung it for a while, but we all know it. You can read that yourself. And you can go to the song. I don't want to try to read from here. But anyway, the song we're going to sing is The Greatest Command, which means the altos start by themselves. Try that and see what happens. Bring it out.
Father, we pray that our worship to you this morning is pleasing. We thank you for the message. We thank you for your grace and love and your mercy, especially when we find ourselves being unlovable. Lord, look down upon those who are hurting. Be with those who are ministering to them. Give us the right words to say so that we may be a comfort to others as well as an encouragement. Help us, Father, to let your light shine in us so that others may see your love and your mercy and want to know more. As we leave this place this morning, Father, help us to take you with us until we meet again. Keep us safe. We pray this in Christ.